For Crema Media's Polity, I am Shannon Durehove. Economists Philip Haslam and Russell Lamberti join me to discuss their book When Money Destroys Nations, which details how hyperinflation ruins Zimbabwe and what lessons other nations can learn from this. Your book, When Money Destroys Nations, tells the fascinating story of Zimbabwe's economic turmoil, including the collapse of its currency in late 2008. Firstly, how do you define hyperinflation? What causes hyperinflation? And how are ordinary people affected by hyperinflation? Uh, hyperinflation is defined in the, in the economics as a, a price rises of 50% per month. Uh, it's a fairly arbitrary number. And, um, and effectively for people that are going through hyperinflation, it's when prices rise excessively on a day-to-day -day basis. It puts pressure on margins. So businesses make less and less profits. And by the time it gets into a hyperinflation, uh, businesses are making losses. So in Zimbabwe, for instance, in 2006, the stores started to go empty. Uh, uh, water ran dry, the fuel ran out, electricity was cut, and uh, it just put a lot of economic pressure on people on the ground. Um, it, it, in this particular scenario, hyperinflation, uh, the effects are um, very real. It's not concepts that econ economists will just talk about as, as high theoretical uh, knowledge. Mm. It's very real, it has very real impacts for individuals on the ground mm. as they go about their daily lives. How did Zimbabwe's episode of hyperinflation come to an end? What are the most important lessons other nations can learn from Zimbabwe's hyperinflation? In Zimbabwe's case, as in all hyperinflations, the specific period of hyperinflation was the last three years. But it was 11 years in the making. It started in 1997 and uh, inflation was very low at that stage. They were printing money on a large scale. It was in response to a debt crisis. And uh, inflation grew and grew and grew and then it started to spiral out of control by uh, 2006, 2007, 2008. Um, so by the time that uh, the end of the hyperinflation arrived, prices were rising on a daily basis significantly as people were standing in queues in the, in the stores. By the time they'd get to the front of the queues, prices had already risen and they'd have to readjust their finances, make sure that they had enough money. Um, it, would, it was rising at such a rate that by the end of 2008, so November 2008, inflation reached practically to an, a, a level of infinity. So, so at that stage, no one would receive any Zimbabwe dollars in, re in return for their trade. Um, this was the moment that the Zimbabwe dollar crashed out of use. Mm. And, and it was the time of what they call dollarization. So where they, where they t turned to a stable alternative currency at the time, which was US dollar and South African rands. Um, but this is what happens in hyperinflation. So in, uh, inflation rises and rises and rises. People don't want to use the currency anymore. So they, they try to get rid of it as fast as they can. And um, this becomes almost like a hysteria. Mm -hmm. uh, what we call it becomes uh, scorched money. And, um, and, and then a time comes when no one actually wants to receive it or, or trade in it at all, um, despite legal tender laws and those sorts of things. It was a total barter economy and it became a very relational economy, yeah. um, su such that relationships were the currency that people actually paid in. Um, uh, but the interesting thing then was that in the women's prisons, uh, sanitary products were so valuable that they became currency. So people started to give goods and services in return for tampons. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's tampon money, but it really was a reflection of how the economy became a barter economy. And, uh, um, and during this time, obviously, if the government's printing money on a large scale, it wants to force people to use that money. I don't want to use newly printed money. I don't want to give my goods and services in return for uh, pieces of paper that the government's printing. Mm. So um, uh, what happened was you got this in significant increase of control from the government on the people to first of all keep prices low and then secondly to, uh, second of all to, to use that money. 
So on the one side you get this development of this of this barter economy, and the other side you've got the government is trying to stop people from bartering and mm. saying, look, you have to use money. And in fact, you're not even allowed, allowed to use cash, you have to use bank money. So we can trace that money, we can trace your transaction, and we can actually control those transactions. So for the last three or four years, the currency was only really in place because of legal tender laws that the government had put in place, despite this whole barter economy that was developing. What are the most important lessons other nations can learn from Zimbabwe's hyperinflation? Um, what we've tried to do in the book is to paint the picture of what happens when nations print money. Mm. Okay? Because it's a very easy alternative for governments to turn to. You know, typically what happens is a government goes into a whole lot of debt and then a debt crisis emerges where they can't borrow any further and they turn to printed money. Mm. Okay, so it's a very easy alternative. What we tried to do is paint how a, a country de uh, uh, descends into hyperinflation through money printing programs, okay? And, um, and particularly how negative that is on a people. It's the worst in economic chaos and disorder. Mm. It's the worst possible outcome. And, um, and yet it's as a result of very easy loose money policies, okay? So the things that other countries can learn is very simple. Learn to rein in your spending, okay? Stop spending in debt. Yeah, very easy, very, very simple concepts, okay? When a debt crisis comes, don't print money. There are many alternatives, to name a few. One, reduce the size of government. Reduce the spending that government does. Two. Look at increasing taxes in a way that's actually effective and, and uh, can, can repay debts. And, and three, if, the, if those two options are not available, look at a managed default process. That's something that, that Greece has looked at uh, in, in the last couple of years and, and has probably has been very painful mm -hmm. and yet has been um, possibly the best way that they've been able to deal with their debts. Would you classify quantitative easing, such as that practiced by the US and other countries in the past few years in response to the global recession, as printing money? What dangers do you see from such policies? What alternative policies should such countries have pursued in response to the global recession? Quantitative easing, or QE as it's become known uh, by amongst the major central banks, is most certainly printing money. At least that's the, that's the term that we use in reality, what they do is they create digital currency on computers out of thin air. Um, so, a hundred years ago or twenty years ago, uh, it was uh, it was a lot of actual money printing, and certainly in Zimbabwe, it eventually became the printing of actual physical cash notes. But with modern banking, it can really be done in a number of ways, um, including just the creation of digital digits on computers, and that's what happens over in the United States and in some of these major economies. So. We just use the term printing money. It's very much the same process. Uh, I think that different central banks have different rules and processes that govern what they do and how they do it and how they implement these policies. But in effect, it, uh, it amounts to, to money printing. Uh, and it was actually something interestingly acknowledged by the, uh, the, the, the governor of the central bank, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, uh, Gideon Gona, who, who once famously said that uh, the policies being conducted by the United States uh, and, and, and Britain were the same as, as that conducted by his own central bank a few years earlier. I think the dangers are quite clear. Uh, when you print money to finance your deficits, mm -hmm. you're essentially saying that, that the marginal value of money is falling close to zero, that you can just create it out of thin air and you can use your power as a government and as a central bank who has a kind of legal monopoly over the money, if you like, to, to just create new money out of nothing. Mm -hmm. So the big risk that you run is a crisis of confidence in the currency itself. People mm -hmm. need to be confident that when they, when they earn money and put it in their wallets or have it in their bank account, that it will actually hold its value, that it will actually be worth something for them tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, typically with low rates of inflation, there's, there's not really a crisis of confidence. We kind of understand that prices will be 5 or 10% higher next year. 
we don't advocate that kind of policy, but at least uh, people generally maintain confidence. But when you when you continue to create money supply and continue to print money out of thin air, you run a real risk of of, of losing confidence in your currency, and that is really what precipitates high and hyperinflation is when people start to lose confidence in, in the money, uh, the, very, the very kind of bedrock of that economy, bearing in mind that every transaction that gets done, money is involved. So money is half the economy. <laughs> money is one side of every trade. And when, when you lose confidence in that side of the trade, it creates absolute havoc and, and chaos on the other side of the trade. And so goods markets and services and, and all, the, all the things that, that are our economy uh, get thrown into dis disarray and disorder, and so it's a hugely, as, as Phil said, it's a hugely chaotic time. It's 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 the extreme in, in economic chaos. Mm -hmm. um, so that is that is really the risk that you run uh, when you print money. Mm -hmm. What alternative policy should these countries implement? Our book is part descriptive and part prescriptive. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, we want to paint the picture of what happens when nations print money. Um, and how to then respond as uh, individuals and, and companies mm. um, because there are a number of innovative ways that people approach these things. But when it comes to dealing with prescriptive uh, aspect of money printing and, and how should this be done, uh, some key things need to be realized. One, it is a very negative thing to be printing money on, on a large scale for, uh, for, for, for any length of time. It, it does some very negative things to the economy. Two, m money printing and the ability for a government to print money actually empowers the government to go into debt. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so we argue that there should be constitutional limits on government spending. Mm -hmm. uh, we argue that the, that the ability to print money should be taken away from, from the government. Um, that, that currency should be privatized we, we uh, so, so, so in a nutshell, we want money to be what it says it is. And, and so there's various ways that one can approach that, but in a nutshell, very high level, that's what, what we see as the prescriptive alternatives. Yeah. And yet, um, we recognize that the vested interests currently in place to print money and to respond to debt crisis with, with uh, quantitative easing and such policies are very, very strong. It requires a huge will of the whole people. And they need to first understand the negative effects of money printing and then be able to respond appropriately. You state that global money printing may be the greatest risk and greatest opportunity of our time. What are some of these risks and opportunities? I think the risks are quite self-evident from what we've laid out in the book. Uh, economic malaise, uh, chaos, uh, if it goes to the extremes. Uh, generally in incredibly difficult economic conditions and usually a major economic depression. So, so you know, GDP that maybe shrinks significantly, uh, people out of work. These are, these are some of the, the major threats to, 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 the, to the man in the street. Mm -hmm. But, you know, every crisis comes with its opportunities. When public services, for example, are failing, when there's no good water supply or good electricity supply, maybe you can be the person supplying water or electricity. Um, when currency is failing and there's a loss of confidence in the medium of exchange, perhaps you could come up with an alternative medium of exchange that works, mm. that people have confidence in, that they can use as a benchmark and a yardstick to price and value things in the economy and to trade with those things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess it's a sort of negative vision of opportunity because it's an opportunity within a crisis. Yeah. Um, but it's to say that people who have ingenuity, who have the ability to, to spot opportunities can, can take them. And in a, in a world where, where chaos becomes sort of prevalent and, and economic relationships are changing rapidly, you know, big opportunities can present themselves. Mm -hmm. I also think that the opportunity lies in recognizing the threat, understanding the threat, being able to watch for the signs 
um, the early warning signs, the storm warnings, uh, as we call them, mm. in the book, um, and to prepare, to prepare in terms of your your personal uh, affairs, to prepare in terms of savings and 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 understanding, you know, what you should be saving in and and where you should be diversifying your risk, and so on. Mm. So that's the kind of opportunity we refer to. The book ends on a positive note, offering ideas on what individuals and governments can do to avoid hyperinflation. Please elaborate on what can be done. Well, uh, in, in Zimbabwe, uh, over one uh, quarter of the country left. It was between a quarter and a third. Um, the pressures for, of hyperinflation were significant, and those that left had those pressures relieved instantly. It's not a message we want to necessarily uh, push too, too much, mm -hmm. But uh, if there's a genuine and legitimate risk of hyperinflation in, in, a, in a country, those people would be wise to seriously consider moving to another place where there's a stable currency. Um, it's that bad. It's that bad. Um, within that context, if people decide to stay, um, the, uh, there are numerous solutions that people need for currency. As Russell mentioned, half an economy is currency. The other half is goods and services and trade. Mm. If you can get into providing uh, people with alternatives to trade in, uh, uh, in, in money, then you'll do very well. An example will be in, in, uh, um, in Harare, uh, in Zimbabwe and, and, and the capital city of Harare, uh, some fuel companies came up with an innovative solution. They began to issue what was known as fuel coupons. You would pay the, uh, the company uh, um, for fuel, they would issue with a fuel coupon, go across the border and uh, collect fuel and come back and deliver the fuel. Okay, So those fuel coupons then became a right to fuel mm. and they were fairly standardized and then people could trade in them. Okay. And, and those became very, very, those became the alternative currency in late 2008. And, um, and so literally people would go to get paid for their legal fees in wads of fuel coupons. Um, many people receive their salaries in fuel coupons. Um, now, those people did very, the, the, the fuel companies that issued those did exceptionally well. Because now it was a demand not just for fuel, mm -hmm. but for currency. Mm -hmm. It, it, it increased the demand for the underlying fuel products. And, um, and there's some various interesting stories that you can read in the book around it. But, but the point being is if you can help people facilitate trade, you will do very, very well in, in, in hyperinflation. Um, if you can increase security, if you can uh, help with uh, uh, community and community communications, mm. you will do well. If you can get into uh, um, trading of key commodities, if you have a key source of supply of key uh, uh, commodities, um, these sorts of things, you, you, they do very well. That was Philip Haslam and Russell Lamberti speaking to Crema Media's Polity about their book, When Money Destroys Nations.